Someday the game comes alive. Pro football, the game for the ear and the eye. A two and a half hour carnival of color, sound, and action. Today on NFL Films Presents, a look back at one of the NFL's greatest teams ever, the 1976 Oakland Raiders. NFL Films Presents is brought to you by... 1976 Ed Raiders, probably one of the most legendary teams in NFL history, and the public's perception of that team is, well, you know, a bunch of renegades, cutthroats, mavericks. Is that true? Our, our ball club had to know the warden real good and have a good, good, <laughs> have a good bail bond and that sort of thing, but yeah, tough guys. I mean, they, everybody has their own ways of getting ready to play. Freddie Boletnikoff. Is it true that he once caught a ball with his forearm? Yeah. He had someone to stick him on? If Freddie brought the stick him out, he would take both forearms uh, from elbow to wrist with the adhesive tape and then smear the stick him all over his forearm. And then he would spray himself with a spray bomb or some stuff I think you could lay brick with. And then Freddie would go out and, uh, you know, he, once he caught the ball, you always had to go to the official, ask for a new ball because it was, you couldn't throw the ball after Freddie caught it. The other thing when you think about the Raiders, you think about going deep, the deep six. But yet, Kenny, when you look at the films, you really didn't have that strong an arm. I mean, you weren't like a Daryl LaMonica that came before you, and yet the public's perception of the 76 Raiders is the deep six. Why is that? Well, my strong suit as a quarterback was not the arm. Mine was more finesse and timing and a high percentage player, you know, and it fit the game at that point in time because everybody went from man-to-man -man type coverages when LaMonica was playing, which fit his style, to zones, which fit my style, and I was a, a finesse, very, very accurate player, I and mean, given the time that I was given behind that great offensive line, and you can do some damage. Your biggest rivalry was with the Pittsburgh Steelers. You played them four times in the playoffs, the AFC Championship. You're coming into the 76 season. First game on the schedule, Pittsburgh Steelers. What'd you think about that? You get so close so many times going into that year, you know, we were wearing that label of not being able to win the big one and to finally do it, to beat Pittsburgh in the opener, to beat Pittsburgh at the final game in the playoffs, and then to go in and beat Minnesota. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful feeling of accomplishment and something that we get to uh, wear very proudly. One reason why the Oakland Raiders went all the way in 1976 was because they were able to overcome the Pittsburgh Steelers, the team that had haunted Oakland throughout the decade of the 1970s. Steelers were growing, and you could see them you get these number one draft picks, and they were all good guys. And when they emerged, they came on so fast that we thought it was our turn. It's no more Chiefs, no more Dolphins, it's the Raiders' turn. Who are these jerks over here in Pittsburgh going to take our thunder? So we got a little upset at these guys. The Raiders had reason to be upset. In the 1972 playoffs, they were victimized by the immaculate reception. Two years later, the Raiders pulled out their own miracle playoff victory. But while Oakland ended Miami's two-year reign as world champions, it was the Steelers who became the successors to the Dolphin dynasty. They beat us in our park in 74 in the championship game. They go on and thump Minnesota in the Super Bowl. 75, we go to Pittsburgh for the championship game and it's freezing. When the teams came out on the field, the, the right sideline was frozen with ice and they suspected that maybe somehow the grounds crew had concocted that. Our game was the throw and the deep ball. So with that ice, we had to move those receivers in and that narrowed the field for us. I'll never forget Pete Rosell said to me, well, it's the same for both sides. I said, damn it, Pete, you don't even understand what you're talking about. It's not the same for both sides. After the 1975 championship, the Raiders did not have to wait long for a rematch. Opening day, it was 100 degrees, the Santa Ana winds were blowing, and here comes the Steelers all cocky. It was like we were going to leave it out there. If we don't win that day, 
forget the season. We put it on the line, we talked about it, Madden pulled out all the stoppers, and we just went after them. With their opening day victory setting the tone, the Raiders marched through the season like men on a mission. They won 13 of 14 games with their finest overall performance coming long after they had clinched the AFC West title. Cincinnati, if they beat us, they were in the playoffs and would knock off, knock out Pittsburgh. If we won, then that would knock out Cincinnati and put in Pittsburgh. I can remember plainly uh, the news the media coming out with, yeah, we're going to lose because we don't want to meet the Steelers. Well, we weren't that type of a team. We weren't the best team on the field to, to play against in order to get to the championship and the Super Bowl. Of all the games I ever coached in my life, I was the most proud of that game and that team. I mean, we not only beat Cincinnati, but we beat them big. The Raiders got what they wanted. This time, there was no icy field, no miracle play. Only a discouraged Steeler team unaccustomed to losing a championship. After the end of the season, when Chuck Noll accuses the Oakland Raiders of uh, brutality in the league or something that made us all go to court over in San Francisco and testify uh, that we were too rough for the Steelers. It was such a joke. Give me a break. And when I just go in there and I, I show him this ring and I show him the score on the side of this ring, Al Davis put 24-7 Raiders, 24 Steelers, 7 on the ring. In Super Bowl XI, the Oakland Raiders completely dominated the Minnesota Vikings. In doing so, the Raiders not only won the 1976 NFL Championship, they put a final definitive end to many years of postseason frustration. We wanted that one Super Bowl, we were committed, we were committed to winning the Super Bowl, not just getting there, but to winning it. And we got there, we won it, and it was the culmination of what you call a dream come true. It shows that if you stick with anything and you believe in it strong enough with conviction and commitment, and you work toward that, that you can accomplish it. And we are the epitome of what hard work is about and what commitment and conviction and what commitment to excellence was about, that 7 to 16, if you wanted to kind of put it in a, in a capsule, and that's the way I would capsulize that team. When we return, a look at the famed and feared Raider Mystique. My high school year. The 76 Raiders were a collection of outlaws from, uh, from all the major penitentiaries around the country. Some of them were real good athletes, some of them I didn't think were very good athletes. They were just intimidating types, would try and hurt people. From the opening bell to the closing bell, you're going to get hit. You're going to get hit hard, and you're going to get hit consistently. We wanted to leave them with an impression that, hey, it's not a contact sport. This is a collision sport, and that's what we did. We made collisions with where I received it. If he did make a catch, he paid a big price for it. He was going to get hit. You know, he's going to get abused verbally, physically. Any other thing we could do to take his mind off of what he had to do and just intimidate him a little bit. When you thought of the Raiders and the mystique of the Raiders, you knew going into the ball game that you were going to get hit. Now, the key was whether you was going to get hit fairly or whether it was going to be a cheap shot. It was just kind of a feeling that once you became a Raider, you were going to go out and you were going to destroy people, you were going to hit them, you were going to intimidate them. And, uh, like we used to say in practice, first one cries a sissy. <laughs> the many crybabies left in the wake of the Silver and Blacks bullying included the New England Patriots, who lost to the Raiders in the 1976 playoffs. But this game eventually resulted in one Patriot exacting a measure of revenge for a controversial play. It was a, a play where Phil Villapiano, outside linebacker, is covering me. I have to battle him off the line. He's hanging on to my, my face mask, punching me in the throat. 
typical Raider uh, defense. And I make the break to the sideline. He's right there and grabs my hands and my arms to my side. Everybody in the country can see this. I turn to Ben Dreith, who's a line judge, and he's looking at Klaus. Phil Fu Villapiano. I wanted to kill him. Just on that play alone, I wanted to kill him. So a couple of weeks later, he's in Hawaii to do the superstar competition. And we go flying to take he and his wife to Maui. I had a charter service halfway between Oahu and Molokai. I tilt the plane up 90 degrees. I open the door and start to push it. And he thinks he's going out the door at uh, 10,000 feet. And his wife was clawing at me, and Phil was screaming at the top of his lungs. There was no way he was going to stay on that airplane. We'd do a couple rolls, loops, you know, whatever, and phew, he'd be uh, fish food. Earlier that year, after New England had defeated the Raiders, Francis discovered that the Raiders' mystique flourished even when they weren't flushed with success. I went into their locker room after the game to kind of gloat a little bit, and I knew also they were the only team in the league that allowed cold beer in the locker room, or any beer for that matter. So someone finally directed me around to where Ted Hendricks was, and he's sitting in a stall in the bathroom. There's beer bottles, he's been there for a while, beer bottles sitting around the uh, stall, and uh, he turned around and took a $100 bill out of his wallet and threw it in the toilet. And I said, what are you doing throwing a $100 bill in the toilet? He said, well, uh, when I was standing up, brought my pants up, a $5 bill fell out of my front pocket into the toilet. I wasn't going in there for five bucks. That was the Raider mentality. That was what you were dealing with. That's what you're playing against. Those guys are weird. The weirdness was no mask, and the team's bad boy image was shaped during a summer camp that seemed more like a funny farm, thanks to unofficial activities director Phil Villapiano, number 41. I thought the boys would like to have a little entertainment, so I found this lovely young lady down the, the bar the night before, and I paid her to show up at practice, and she streaked the practice field. And, 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 Madden blows the whistle, time out, go ahead, do what you gotta do, now get out of here, you know. Villa Piano, with his antics, every year he would form these different events for us to keep camp from being so monotonous. He would break the monotony with these different games, and they were all about who could cheat the best. I remember in one hockey tournament that year, they uh, put a, uh, this is uh, air hockey, okay? The, um, they put a, a plastic uh, glass across one of the goals. So, uh, None of the pucks from the opposing team could go in, and it, w and it was unnoticed till the final game that uh, why the team had got there to the, to the playoffs. <laughs> we had one rule with the Raiders when we were playing golf, and that was if you wasn't cheating, you wasn't trying. It was a fun team to be around. We were about a family, teamwork, and we, we believed in that old saying, once a Raider, always a Raider. And we were, we were Raider players that uh, believed in one another, and we showed it on the field as well as off the field. The 1976 Raiders mystique was part fun, part ferocity. And this split personality helped them attain the singular identity of a champion. Hi, I'm John Madden, and we'll be right back with NFL Films Presents. To take charge early in their game against San Diego. But just before halftime, the Chargers' defense provided the break of the game. Calvin Williams out of the 25, fumbles the ball, it's picked up by Seau, 20, 15, down to the 10, to the 5. The Chargers beat the Eagles 27-21, thanks to Junior Seau with the McDonald's break of the week. Four-year, $30 million contract with Fox, and I called all the plays. They taste fantastic. Oh, sure, there are a lot of other beers around. On television... John Madden literally bursts out at you. As an advertising spokesman, he demands your attention. And in the broadcast booth, his insight and energy have made him the dean of pro football analysts. And if you give him a lane in there, a pass rush lane, he'll take it. You see that hole right there? He's the only way you get it back. Today, John Madden is a permanent part of America's football experience. Yet years earlier, Al Davis confounded the Oakland fans when he chose his little-known 32-year-old linebacker coach to lead the Raiders. We were like kids. We, we had our dreams. He had a big ego. I had a big ego, but we were smart enough to know that we wanted the same thing. I had been a head coach only in junior college, and he gave me an opportunity. I mean, you know, 
who's John Madden? I mean, you know, 32, you know, what, what did I do? Nothing. Over the next 10 seasons, Madden went from mystery man to miracle worker. He holds the record for the best regular season winning percentage of any coach with 100 victories, winning three of every four games that he coached. Well, John Madden was the Raiders. I mean, his personality, his intensity, his persona, everything about John, his appearance, was ideally suited for the Raiders. These guys responded to him when possibly they couldn't have responded to anyone else, no matter how smart or gifted they'd be. We liked John. He was a, a player's coach. He let us play football. He let us have fun. And we won. We wanted a win for him. And that's really the key to coaching in the National Football League, is will the players play for you? And he always gave us a chance to do what we had to do as a team. He always stressed, whatever you guys do, just do it together and do it as one. Madden molded that team through trust, a deceptively simple approach to leadership. Once we got to be a good football team, he knew that we would take care of business on the field, just leave them alone, pitch them the ball. John basically pitched me the playbook and said, go win. Do whatever in the hell you want to do, just go win. And we did. And that was his coaching style, and we all respected that in him. I only had three rules, and you know, to be on time, you know, like we're going to have a meeting or somebody, everyone's on time to do that. And to pay attention, you know, listen when you're speaking, because if you're going to teach, you had to listen. And then play like hell when I tell you to. Play like hell on Sunday. John Madden's own passion for the game was most visible when he conducted the orchestrated mayhem of Raider football. If you look back, you'll see film clips of Madden running down the sideline after a touchdown. He tries to jump after a touchdown. He gets off the ground about two inches. And if you go back and look in the film, you'll find that. <laughs> John wasn't the kind of guy to hold his feelings in, especially, you know, during the game. He liked to run and jump up and down the sideline, holler and scream at the officials. And, you know, I think he did that so that we didn't have to. The madness of Madden had method. He was a master motivator and team psychologist. He would make us start thinking about something that had absolutely nothing to do with the game to get us to play harder against this team. Say a Chuck Noll was a little too serious on the sideline. He'd build a whole case about this. And I used to love him, man. I could get so mad and so intense about something that had totally nothing to do with me. But that's the way he had us playing, and it, was, it worked all the time. Madden uh, was able to paint a picture for us. Here's what we want to accomplish, and here's how we would get there to do that. In 1976, Madden had painted his masterpiece, and with the broad brush strokes of his leadership, he taught his team their final lesson. Perseverance, you know, keep getting up, you get knocked down, get up, get up, get up, keep getting up. John's a big fight fan, I'm a big fight fan. You know, in a good fight, the last one up wins. But even the glory road of Super Bowl XI had one final bump. At the Super Bowl, we tried to pick him up. We said, here's our chance to carry Madden off. So we tried to carry Madden off. A couple of guys, biggest guys we had, they dropped him. He falls. But that was typical of that 76 team. Despite their challenges, Madden and the 76 Raiders had finally reached the top. 